We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And Paul seems to indicate here, well, he, he says that the rapture is going to happen at the last trumpet. What was Paul talking about when he said the last trumpet? Well, I think he was probably making reference to the Feast of Trumpets. You see, all these people say, no man, no, at the day or the hour. End of discussion. Case closed. You can't know when Jesus comes back. All they're doing is staying right there, and they're not reading the rest of the Bible. The reason no one can know the day or the hour here is because there was a transition point right here where Jesus could have come back right there. Church age. And that's what we're in today, where God called the Apostle Paul, and Romans through Philemon, of course, are the books of Paul. And now we're in this time period, an age of grace, an age of salvation, by grace through faith in the gospel. I like to call this the church age. But we're saved by 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel. All right, now, with that mentioned, we're going to get to that in a second, but let's look at Jesus' ministry, because there's three places in which, in his time, in his ministry, Jesus says that no man knows the day or the hour of when he's coming. Let's look at those. Matthew 24, 36 is the first one. And there Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He says, But as the days of Noah, so shall also be the coming of the, of the days of the Son of Man. So Jesus says, I don't know, the angels don't know, only God the Father knows the day of the rapture. So that was Matthew 24:36. All right, let's look at Matthew 25. We look at all three of these. 25, 13. And then we're going to look at Mark 13, 35. Or excuse me, 32. There we go. So these are the three places where Jesus says, No man knoweth the day or the hour of when he will return at the rapture. So Matthew 25, 13 is the second one. And it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So the first time he says, Nobody knows, not even the angels, just my Father in heaven. Now here he says, No man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now Mark 13, 32 says, But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So these are the three passages, and notice what they say. Those who don't know, whoops. he said the Son doesn't know, so that means Jesus didn't know when he was coming back. He said the angels in heaven don't even know, and he says that man doesn't know. So Jesus said in those three passages, he says, No man knoweth the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, not even me, the Son of Man, and neither does any man on earth know at that time when the rapture will come. So right there, man, people, people say, see, there it is, case closed, end of discussion, no man can ever know the day or the hour of the rapture. Who can know? Well, Jesus said the Father in heaven is the only one that knows. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Does that mean it's it? That's the end of the argument? It's over? That no man can know? Or was Jesus speaking here before the cross and saying that no man knew because there was a transition that could take place here in the future? As you study the Bible, you know what you find out? You find out when Jesus came, Jesus said he was a Jew only going to Jews. He said, I come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus rose again, he sent out his apostles to Jews, to the Jewish nation. And there was a possibility that the Jewish nation could accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so this book of Acts, as the book of Acts continues, it's a book of transition. And as a transitional book, we see some amazing things when we get over here to Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. In Acts chapter 7, well actually let's go to Acts chapter 1 first. I'm going to look at Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Then we're going to look at Acts 7, 55. And let's see if 
something happened that made it possible to where we just may know someday when is the day of the rapture. Because certainly Jesus in his day said no man knows when he's coming. No argument with that. Three times he was dogmatic. The son, he didn't even know. Jesus didn't know. The angels and man would know what would be the time of Jesus coming. But could it be that he said that then because there was a time over here where things could have been transitional and could have changed? And had they changed, then we could know when he's coming? Well, let's, let's, let's look into that and see if that's even possible. Acts chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 8. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So Jesus Christ is there, resurrected from the dead, and his disciples ask him, Are you going to come back and restore Israel again? Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. He says, You guys can't know when I'm coming back. That almost sounds like these other three times, no man knoweth. But he says, which the Father hath put in his own power. It's all in the power of the Father. It's all based upon the, what the Father wants to do. In verse 8, But Jesus shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto other most parts of the earth. So then Jesus was taken up, verse 9. So we see Jesus back here dogmatically saying, Nobody knows, not even these three, when Jesus will return. Here they ask, When well, are you coming back? He says, Not for you to know. Okay, so there... Let's go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. Because we're told in the Bible that Jesus Christ descended up in heaven and sat down on the right hand of the Father, so Jesus is up in heaven right now. But as he's sitting up there at the right hand of the Father, something takes place in Acts chapter 7 that's amazing. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. The Pharisees stoned Stephen. And look at what Stephen says. Verse 55, but he, which is Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Wow. Acts 2, 25 and verse 23 tells us Jesus Christ was sitting on the right hand of God. But here, in Acts 7, 5 to 55, Jesus is standing. Why would Jesus be standing at the right hand of God rather than sitting? Well, I believe that he could have right then come back and set up his kingdom on earth. Had those Pharisees, had that Jewish nation accepted their Messiah right then. So the reason Jesus would have said, no man knoweth the day or hour, because everything hinged upon right there what they were going to do. And so since those Jews rejected their Messiah, God said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And as you read through the book of Acts, it's plain to see that the rest of the book of Acts, God has taken Paul and taking Peter and taking others and taking salvation to the Gentiles rather than the Jews. So now shows up Paul, and we're told in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13 that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. So now the book of Acts is from Jews to Gentiles, and we see Paul going out. And sure, he goes into synagogues, preaches to the Jew first. That's why he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentiles. But he is the apostle to the Gentiles. God reveals unto him some things, and the gospel for today of salvation is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now we look at Paul's writings. Is there anywhere in the writings of Paul where he says we can know the date of the rapture? You see, all these people that say, no man knoweth the day or the hour. End of discussion. Case closed. You can't know when Jesus comes back. All they're doing is staying right there, and they're not reading the rest of the Bible. The reason no one can know the day or the hour here is because there was a transition point right here where Jesus could have come back right there. But because they rejected him, he extended this time period and took the gospel of salvation to the Gentiles. Interestingly, many Bible scholars acknowledge that we entered a Jubilee year starting on September 23rd, 2015. So when he says at the last trump, I do not believe that that's talking about the trumpets, the seven trumpets in, tribu in the tribulation period. I believe that that probably has to do with the Feast of Trumpets. says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And Paul seems to indicate here 
Well, he, he says that the rapture is going to happen at the last trumpet. What was Paul talking about when he said the last trumpet? Well, I think he was probably making reference to the Feast of Trumpets. Throughout the book of Corinthians, Paul makes allusions to a number of the Jewish feasts. And uh, a little chart up here. Of my... The first pe uh, feast was uh, Passover. That's in the spring. And then that was uh, during what's called the Feast of Un Unleavened Bread. And Unleavened Bread was a seven-day period where God said to Israel, do not eat anything leaven. And throw all the leaven out, you know, all your wonder bread, all your thick cloves of bread, you gotta throw it all out. You eat only the matzah, the thin crackers, unleavened bread during that seven days. The first night of it was Passover. And Jews today still celebrate Passover. It's the only, oldest running feast in the world. 3,500 years they've been celebrating that. And then the first day after the Sabbath, what day would that be, the day after the Sabbath? Sunday, right. Was another Jewish feast called the Feast of First Fruits. And then they counted 50 days, or seven weeks plus one, 50 days, and they had another Jewish feast called Pentecost. Now, these feasts were not only historical in nature, they were prophetic in that they spoke of things to come. When Israel celebrated the first Passover 14, some 1,400 years before Jesus. What happened some 1,400 years later on Passover on the very day? Jesus, the lamb, was sacrificed for our sin as the Passover lamb. And then the day after the Sabbath, Sunday, was the Feast of First Fruits. And what happened on that day? Resurrection of Jesus. He arose from the dead, as Paul says in this book, he is the first fruits of them that rise from the dead. Most Christians don't realize that the resurrection of Jesus was on a Jewish holiday, a feast day. They counted another 50 days, and they came to Pentecost. What happens on Pentecost? Spirit of God come down, the church starts. Now, there is a break. These, these feasts are set up on an agricultural calendar. That You had four of them in the spring. There was a long break during the summer. Then you had another three in the fall. During the summer, what are they doing? They're bringing in the harvest. We are now living in this church age. It's the harvest age. We're bringing in the harvest. Jesus said, pray you for the Lord of the harvest. Bring more laborers. The, you know, the harvest is great, workers are few. What's the next feast on the prophetic calendar? It is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets prophetically speaks of the rapture of the church. So when Paul says that the rapture is going to happen at the last trumpet, I think he's probably talking about the Feast of Trumpets. Now, on the Feast of Trumpets, there are 100 trumpet blasts sounded throughout the day. There are four different types of trumpet blasts. There is a takaya, which is one long blast. There is a shavarim, three short ones, you know, like doot, doot, doot. There's a tura, nine short ones. Do, 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 and then the 100th trumpet, the Tekaya Gadola, the great or the last trumpet, is the 100th trumpet blast on the Feast of Trumpets. Is Paul telling us the rapture will happen on the Feast of Trumpets? Now, we've briefly talked about the rapture in an earlier segment, but now I would like to go deeper into the Feast of Trumpets celebrated during Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year. This is when the Jewish New Year begins, uh, and it typically falls in September. This is also when the agricultural or civil calendar starts. The religious calendar starts on Nisan 1, uh, which falls between our March and our April. Now, it's important to understand that the feasts happen and are celebrated in order. Unleavened bread was buried. He rose on first fruits, not the day before, not the day after. Uh, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, happened on Pentecost. So the fall events will happen on their appointed days. We don't know what year, but it's important to know that they will happen on these feast days and in order. You can't have Pentecost until he rose on first fruits. He's not going to rise until he's buried. He's not going to be buried until he dies. 
The same is true for the last three fall feasts. They're all going to happen in order. And the first fall feast to be prophetically fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, this is the feast that is associated with the rapture of the church. We don't know what year again, but we know it's going to happen during this feast. And you'll see why as we continue through this lesson. This year, the Feast of Trumpets starts on September the 8th. Uh, this is the 2010 starting from 6 p.m. in the evening and it runs until the 10th uh, at 6 p.m. of that evening. We talked about the Hebrew word seasons, uh, which means moed uh, in the Hebrew, and it also means a divine appointment. Uh, God has already scheduled some divine appointment. He's already told us he's going to be there, so we want to make sure that we are there when he shows up. Uh, God in his mercy and love gave us these festivals so we could know and rehearse what to expect according to Leviticus 23. Now God also wants us to proclaim these feasts and that's what we're doing through this video. And that's what you should be doing. We should tell people uh, about God's divine appointments and his feast days. So the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the Feast of Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot, are the three four feasts and they all happen in the Jewish month of Tishri, which is September. And here's what they represent. First of all, the Feast of Trumpets uh, represents repentance. The Feast of Yom Kippur represents redemption and the Feast of Tabernacles represents rejoicing. You can see how they fall in order. First you need to repent before you can be redeemed and after you're redeemed then you can rejoice. But Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is a feast that has different descriptions and events occurring at this time. Uh, this feast is also known as the day when no man knows the day or the hour uh, or when he comes as a thief in the night. It's known as the hidden day or the day of concealment or the day of the new moon. It's also known as the day of the blowing of trumpets or Yom Teruah in Hebrew. Also uh, the day of the last trump as well as the day of the awakening blast. It's also known as uh, Jacob's trouble. We know this to be the tribulation period uh, or the beginning of the ten days of R. It's also known as opening of the gates, opening of books and the day of judgment. As well as the day of the coronation of the king or Hamalech in the Hebrew as well as the wedding of the Messiah, Hakidusin, in the Hebrew. So these are all uh, uh, terminologies and idioms that's associated with Rosh Hashanah. So let's look at the first one. No man knows the day or the hour or where he comes as a thief in the night. Throughout this video, we've seen how God uses signs in the heavens to signal his appearing, his purpose and his plans for mankind. Now we've looked at the lunar eclipses, which we know is, you know, the Bible refers to as blood moons. Uh, and we've seen how God has marked major events concerning his people throughout the centuries. We've also seen how God specifically told Noah what to expect and how to prepare so he and his family would be safe uh, during the outpouring of God's wrath. This is what the scripture says in Genesis 6 verse 17. Uh, I'm about to send a flood on the earth to destroy all people under the sky. Every living, breathing, human, everything on earth will die, God says. Uh, but I will make my promise to you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives will go into the ship. He did the same for Lot and his family during the outpouring of his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, scripture says this in Amos 3, 7, certainly the Almighty Lord doesn't do anything unless he first reveals uh, his secret to his servants, the prophets. Right at the beginning of this video series, we talked about the fact that God will never indiscriminately destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. Uh, in Daniel 12, 4, scripture also tells us that knowledge shall be increased in the last days. And I think uh, with the advent of the internet and recent biblical discoveries, uh, including what you're watching right now in this video, I think it's safe to say that we live uh, in a time when knowledge has indeed increased exponentially. Uh, we also said that scripture needs to be read in context. You can't have one pet verse and build a doctrine around that one verse. Well, this is exactly what most Christians have done with Matthew 25 verse 13, where it says, What's therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Whenever I tell people, including most Christians, that Jesus is coming back very soon, this is their favorite verse to quote. If no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, what good will he do to study Bible prophecy? First of all, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 and 2. Now, if you remember, I said the feasts refers to appointed times. And if you remember in Genesis, the very word season is moed, which also refers to festivals. Well, look, look at what Paul writes uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. It says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Now, what is Paul saying when he says, You don't have need that I write unto you? 
He's saying you understand the festivals. Look at verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It seems here he's implying that this is no surprise. Let's have a look further and see what he's referring to. If you go to the book of Revelations, Revelation 3 verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest and are dead. So who is he writing to? He's writing to the dead church. And look at what he tells them to do. He says, Be watchful, dead church, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found their works perfect before God. And now look at what he says to them. If they don't watch, he says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore thou shalt not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So yeah, he comes as a thief in the night to the dead church. And he's saying, if you, dead church, will not watch, I will come upon you in a day and hour that you do not expect. He's not talking to the church that is watching, but he's talking to the dead church. Now look at, uh, let's look at verse 17 of Revelation 3, where he speaks to the church of Laodicea. So it says in Revelation 3 verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So that's a pretty uh, accurate description there. Uh, verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And again it says that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now we have to tie the scripture in with Revelation 16 verse 15. Look at what it says here. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now look at this. Look at the following illustration and you'll understand where this scripture uh, has its Jewish origins from. Here's a depiction of what happened during the time of Messiah. And it talks about the captain of the guard, uh, how he would come at night. And if you remember in the, in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, uh, you know, God lit the first fire that fell on the altar. Because of that, the priests were commanded to stay awake and make sure the fire never goes out. So when the captain of the guard would come, if he found one of these priests sleeping, he would literally take a torch, uh, light it from the altar they were supposed to be watching, and he would set their garments on fire because he was sleeping. And the priest would be jumping up and down so that he's awake, uh, ripping his garments off and running naked in the temple so that his shame uh, would be seen. This is a, a direct reference to Revelation uh, 16 verse 15. And during those days, the captain of the guard uh, was also referred to as the thief in the night. So Jesus is saying, I'm coming like a thief in the night, but not to those that are faithful and watching. It's a warning to the church who's not watching, who doesn't believe in prophecy, nor are they aware of his feast days, or that he's coming on an appointed time and feasts, which he communicates to us through the signs in the heavens. That's who he's writing to in Revelation 3. The Christian community or churches who's not watching and are asleep, who's not only spiritually dead, but they're also totally unaware that God's timetable and future events calendar is a Jewish one. And he's saying when you realize that the rapture took place and when you see the things begin to happen on the earth that was foretold by scripture, uh, you're going to run around screaming and exposing your shame because you were left behind even though you said you were my children. So this is a warning to those that are not watching, who does not believe and are not aware of his divine appointments on his feast days. Uh, going back to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, look at what it says here. It says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon uh, them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now look at verse 4. It says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that this day should overtake you as a thief. It says here, yeah, but ye brethren, again, you know, a lot of people walk around literally bragging that no man know the day or the hour. And the Bible said, ye, you are not in darkness. You should be knowing, you know, uh, the times and the seasons as we are discussing in this. You are not in darkness. You should be knowing, you know, uh, the times and the seasons as we are discussing in this video. You are not in darkness. Again, we see here that sudden destruction comes upon them and they shall not escape. But you are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief in the night. You'll be watching, you'll be waiting, you'll be prepared. You know about the feast days. 
God doesn't want us to be in darkness. We should be aware of his appointments and feast days. So we can what? Watch. If you know God's feast days, you know his divine appointments, then you can watch. The ten virgins is another example where it comes as a thief in the night to those that are not watching. Look at Matthew 25, 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us uh, of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Now the other virgins, who is he talking here? These are the other virgins, the other foolish virgins that went to go and buy the oil, right? So these are the, he's not talking to the foolish virgins. The Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. What's therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man coming. Again, it says, What's therefore for ye? Who is he talking to? He's talking to the other virgins. The other five that went to go and buy, he says, What's therefore for ye know neither the day nor the hour? Now, if you remember, the other virgins, they went inside. They are already inside. The other wise virgins went in the door was such. So again, we see he's speaking to the foolish virgins. He was not speaking to the wise because they were already on the inside. And he's saying, what's therefore for ye, foolish virgins, know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And then if you go to Luke 12, we have the story of the faithful servants and the unfaithful servants. Luke 12, 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second was, or come in the third was, and find them so, uh, blessed are those servants. Why are they blessed? Because they are watching. Luke twelve thirty nine says, And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now look at what Peter asks him. Uh, Peter is going right to the core of the question. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him rule over all that he hath. But and if that servant, now look, he's not talking to the foolish servant. He says, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. This is now, he's not talking to the foolish servant. He's a foolish servant. He's saying, my Lord is coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens. Uh, and to eat and drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant, the foolish servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Again, we see that he's, he's talking to the wise servants, he's talking to the foolish servants. In case of the wise servants, he's saying, Blessed is the wise servant that is watching. If the Lord of that servant, the foolish servant, shall not watch, he will come upon him in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sorrow, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers, it says. So to summarize again, if you don't believe that he's coming, you get reluctant in your walk with God, or you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is saying he will come upon you as a thief in the night and in an hour when you don't expect him. And you need to know what the signs are to be watching. Now, we talked about this in previous segments, but Israel becoming a nation in 1948 and the recapture of Jerusalem in 1967 is major signs pointing to his return. When you look at Luke 19, verse 41 through to 44, we see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees for not knowing the time of the visitation. Uh, in fact, verse 41 says he wept because they were not aware of the signs. God wants you to be aware of the signs and the times. He loves you and he won't come upon you as a theme of the night if you're watching, if you're aware of the signs, if you're aware of his feast days and if you observe his holy convocations. Even more important is to watch the feast days and specifically the Feast of Trumpets. Since this is the feast as we'll discover further in this video segment when he'll come back for his bride. Now we don't know what year but we do know it's going to be during this feast. If he's fulfilled all the spring festivals to the day, he most surely will fulfill all the fall festivals to the day. The Feast of Trumpets is prophetically next in line. 
Now, we've pointed out several scriptures that conclusively prove that these warnings were given to dead and sleeping churches to those that are not watching for him. But let's look at the original statement made by Jesus that no man know the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven, only the Father. Uh, keep in mind that Jesus was a Jew, speaking to a Jewish audience who know when the Jewish festivals are celebrated. So the Jews know that all the feasts are celebrated during the middle of the month on a full moon based on the sighting of the new moon. So if they were celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for example, all they had to do was to add 14 days after uh, they've spotted the new moon to know when to start the feast. The Feast of Trumpets, however, is the only feast that is based on the sighting of the new moon. Because the Feast of Trumpets are on the first day of the month, based on the sighting of the new moon, two witnesses would have to go to the sun at sunset to verify that they saw the new moon, and at that time they would start to observe the feast. But because the Jewish day starts at sunset, they had to literally set fires on the mountains to let all the Jews in the different regions or the diaspora know it's the time or the first of the month and the start of the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, which is also their Jewish New Year. And because the feast started at sunset, well, most Jews sleep at night just like we do, uh, meaning when they woke up in the morning, the feast was already half over and they had to keep it the entire day. And so what they did, they kept the feast for two days and it was known as one long day. And because it was based on the sighting of the new moon, it was literally a feast where, here it comes, no man knew the day or the hour when the feast would start. Even to this day, the Feast of Trumpets is kept as a two-day feast because the sighting of the new moon could fall on either one or the other day. So when Jesus was saying, you won't know the day or the hour, he was actually telling you it's the Feast of Trumpets that is coming back for his bride during the rapture. Now, we don't know the exact day and hour, but it's either going to take place on one day or the other during that feast. The Jews knew the feast day, so they immediately understood what Jesus meant. No wonder Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 concerning the times and seasons, You have no need that I write unto you, because the Feast of Trumpets is the only feast also uh, where the shofar is blown a hundred times. You have three distinct sounds blown in sets of nine and repeated eleven times, which gives you ninety-nine. Uh, the last one, which is one long blow, is always referred to as the last trump. So when you see in First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, where it says, uh, uh, with the trump of God, it's referring here to that specific feast, the last trump. It's talking about the Feast of Trumpets during that feast. We know from 1 Corinthians 15.52 where it says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. As well as 1 Thessalonians 4.16 as mentioned, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we know from these scriptures, we know that he's clearly describing the Feast of Trumpets because it's the only feast where the term last trump or trump is used uh, in the singular form, not the plural. plural. Rosh Hashanah is also known as the hidden day or the day of concealment or the day of the new moon. Now if you remember in earlier segments, we talked about how the rapture proceeds and actually triggers the seven year tribulation period that is to come on the earth. We briefly touched on the fact that God has made provisions for his children through the rapture to be hidden during the outpouring of his wrath. In this segment, I'd like to go deeper and share with you some scriptures that clearly shows that this is happening uh, during the Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah. Also, it's important to understand that Rosh Hashanah and the Feast of Trumpets are Jewish feasts kept by Jews with Jewish customs and Jewish terminology. So when you read about these feasts in an English Bible, but you don't understand the customs, uh, the terminology, or the Jewish audience Jesus was speaking to, you'll only get some of the message, but not the entire message, because you lack that Hebraic perspective surrounding the scripture. Most people, when you talk about feast, they would think of food, but the Hebrew word for feasts is moed, uh, which also means a divine appointment, which not only has a totally different meaning, it also has totally different scriptural implications. Uh, that is why it's so important to know the Hebrew perspective so we can get the entire picture of what God is trying to tell us, which the Jews knew uh, and understood naturally. With that said, let's look at a scripture now and see how God is hiding the believer or church during the tribulation. 
Isaiah 26, 19 uh, through to 21 says, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust, for that dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyselves, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Uh, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. This phrase about the indignation coming is a phrase that Bible scholars indicate refers to the time of the tribulation, where God is going to pour out his wrath on the inhabitants of the earth, like in the days of Noah. And you'll shortly see why this passage of scripture is connected to the Feast of Trumpets during Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is mostly referred to in the English uh, just as the Feast of Trumpets, even though there are many other events taking place uh, during this time as we've outlined. The three main Jewish themes of the Feast of Trumpets are, number one, the resurrection of the righteous, Revelation 26, the coronation of the king, Revelation 19, 11 through to 16, and the marriage of the king, Revelation 19, uh, from verse 7 through to 9. When you say Feast of Trumpets, that word alone identifies that it's about the blowing of trumpets. The rapture, as we've said in the beginning of this video series, is the Latin word rapturo, or the Greek word harpazo. And these words simply mean caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through to 18, uh, snatch away by force, uh, John 10, 27 through to 29, and gathering together, Ephesians 1, verse 9 through to 10. Remember at the beginning of this segment, I said it's important to understand uh, Jewish customs from a Hebraic perspective. Well, when you understand a Jewish wedding, you'll see as plain as daylight how the rapture event is symbolic of a Jewish wedding. During the Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah, the gate of heaven is open. And we'll talk a little more about this later. But the reason for this is because of what's called the home taking. And the home taking idea is connected to the Jewish wedding. Let me give you an example. Uh, in the ancient Jewish weddings, when the man would come secretly to the woman's house and snatch her out of the house, what they would do is they would carry her in a box with handles on known as the aperion. The Hebrew word is nisuin, which also means to lift up or to carry. And four men on either side would then lift her up and carry her. Then they would carry her off to where she would meet her husband. In our case, we're going to meet the Lord in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 18. Lifting up the bride is an ancient Jewish wedding custom of carrying the bride to the ceremony in a carriage called the Aperion. She would be accompanied by singers, dancers and ten young virgins carrying real tall poles with oil lamps on top. That's where the parable of the ten virgins with the oil lamps comes from. Uh, in the ancient Jewish wedding, these ten virgins were actually connected to the wedding event. Then the couple goes and enters into what is called a hoopah, which is the marital chamber, and they stay there for seven days. Then they come out and go back into public. The picture of that is if you read the Bible, many times days are interchanged for years. The Bible says Israel doubted God for 40 days, so God said, I will give you a year for a day, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Likewise, while the bride and groom are hidden in the marital chambers for seven days, prophetically it's speaking of the seven-year tribulation that takes place during the time on the earth, and the Feast of Trumpets is the event when this takes place. The bride and groom going into the hoopah is being concealed together. In other words, they are hidden from public. So the meaning of the catching away of the believer is for the body of Christ to be hidden away, just like Isaiah 26, 20 said in the time of God's indignation. Verse 20 says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, uh, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Come into thy chambers and shut the door is Jewish terminology. And if you lived uh, during that time, you'd immediately understand that he's using a wedding term. So the bride and groom are to be hidden until the indignation is overpassed. And most scholars agree this means a time of judgment and a time of God pouring out his wrath upon the earth uh, for their disobedience. We use the term tribulation to describe that time period. Another name for Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hakaseh, meaning the day of hiding. When you do a Hebrew root study of the word hakaseh, it means to hide, conceal, or to cover. The reason it's called Yom Hakaseh, a day of hiding, is because most feasts are centered around the full moon. Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, is the only feast that is centered around a new moon. When there is a full moon, it's not concealed. But when there's a new moon, it's concealed. So Rosh Hashanah is also referred to as the day of concealment because the moon is not visible and only when two witnesses see the edge of the moon, they knew that it was time for Rosh Hashanah, which is also their Jewish New Year, or the Feast of Trumpets 
to begin. Now we have satellites that enables them to know exactly when this feast starts. But in those days, two witnesses had to go to the Sanhedrin and declare that they have seen the new moon. And because the Jewish day begins at sunset, as we've mentioned, it took two days for all the Jews to know to celebrate the feast. That's why no man knew the day or the hour when the feast would start. They knew roughly what time, but they couldn't tell you for sure until there was a sign of the new moon in the heavens. So when Jesus made this statement, he was alluding to the Feast of Trumpets as the feast that he would return for his bride during the rapture. Now look at these doors verses. Isaiah 26, 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Matthew 24, 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Matthew 25, 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So you've got all these verses that talk about a door being shut, right? Yet in Revelation 4, 1, John says, I saw a door open. Now, if you know the book of Revelation, you'll know the first three books of Revelation. Uh, it talks to the churches. Uh, then there is no mention of the churches again throughout the entire book of Revelation. Why? Because the church has been raptured through that open door in Revelation 4. So the door in heaven is open. We are caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 18. And then he shuts the door. We know that the bride of Christ is being hidden while God's wrath is being poured out according to Isaiah 26, 21 and Revelation 14, 10, which also confirms this. Just look at the scripture. Zephaniah 2, 1. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Now what's the rapture also called? The gathering together, right? And the word gather is the Hebrew word kasash, and it denotes collecting something. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. So the word gathering together here is referring to the rapture event. And when you look at all these befores in Zephaniah, you get a picture of what verse 3 is saying. Verse 3 is saying, that it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So we can see, first the rapture has to take place so that the believer can be hid during the Lord's anger. Zephaniah clearly ties everything together concerning the fact that the Feast of Trumpets is not only when the rapture will occur, it's also known as the day of concealment from events to follow after the rapture, which we know is the tribulation period. Uh, one other verse I want to give you is for Psalms uh, 81 uh, verse 3. Psalms 81 3 says, Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. And we know it's talking about the Feast of Trumpets here because it's the only feast celebrated on a new moon or a concealed moon. Rosh Hashanah is also known as the day of the blowing of trumpets or Yom Teruah. 30 days before on the month of Elul, the trumpets or the shofar are blown calling people to repent, to remember their sins and prepare for the judgment. They blow the shofar every evening for 30 days. On Rosh Hashanah, when the Feast of Trumpets culminates, it is blown a total of a hundred times in various tones. The Takiya, a three-second sustained note, Shevarim, three one-second notes, uh, rising in tone, and Teruah, the hundredth blast, which is uh, a long, loud wail, and it's also called the last... The following are the four traditional shofar blasts. The first one is the Tekiya, which is a long blast. The Shevarim, which is three broken blasts. The Teruah, which is the alarming sound that the enemy is approaching, and the Tekia Agadola, which is the last one law sound blast that increments. Tekia.
A reference to that is 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through to 18. In the, two, in the previous uh, two segments, I believe we thoroughly covered the fact that both 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 52 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, as well as Psalms 81, verse 3 and numerous other scriptures were talking about this feast. Uh, let's now look at some other meanings associated with the blowing of trumpets. Leviticus 23, 24 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, we know this is Tishri, in the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. There's that word convocation again. And we know it means a dress rehearsal. Uh, God wants the children of Israel to observe the first of the seventh month, uh, which is Tishri 1, which is also uh, Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, he wants them to observe that as a Sabbath. Also, this was to be a day of the blowing of trumpets, as well as a memorial. Now, what do we do during Memorial Day? We remember the dead of those that was in service. Look at what Numbers 10.9 says, And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Now again, God is saying when you blow the shofar, you will be remembered before the Lord your God. It's like saying, oh God help us when you blow the shofar. God remembers uh, to deliver you. So the whole concept of this day is to be remembered. We want to remember God and we want God to remember us. Luke 13, 27 says, But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. Whence you are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. So by the blowing of the shofar, we remember God and he remembers us. Malachi 3, 16 says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So when you just think or talk about God's grace with fellow Christians, the Bible says God hears and has it written down in a book of remembrance. Uh, in that day, yeah, it's, it is referring to the gathering together or the rapture of the saints. And when you have, and I will spare them, this is referring to the time uh, when the saints will be hidden in the marital chambers of heaven after the rapture. In Judaism, it is thought that this is also the same day that Isaac was bound to the altar by Abram. When God asked Abram to offer up Isaac, that happened on this day. It's believed the offering of Isaac occurred on Rosh Hashanah. It is said among the Jews that when God hears the sound of the shofar, he is moved to leave his seat of judgment and go to his seat of mercy and forgiveness. And remember what Abram caught in a thicket? Genesis 22, 13, And Abram lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abram went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And so the ram's horn is to remind God to show mercy and not judgment. So this is what we to remember. And who does Isaac represent? Yeshua, Jesus, that was bound to the cross and sacrificed for our sins. And look at what it says in Numbers. Numbers 29, 1 says, And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Here we see again the previous scriptures in Leviticus 23 confirmed that it should be a day of blowing the trumpets and a holy convocation or a dress rehearsal. The word yom is the Hebrew word for day and the word teruah is the Hebrew word for blowing. Now look at what teruah means. Teruah means blowing, first of all. It means a battle cry as well as uh, to blow an alarm. So it's like an alarm clock. It means to rejoice or to shout. These are all keywords associated uh, with the day of the blowing of trumpets. You know, it's an alarm, it's a battle cry, it's the shout. Remember that verse where it says, with the shout of the archangel, uh, First uh, Thessalonians 4, verse 16 to 18, it will come down, uh, and it's as well as an alarm. So when you look at all these keywords, the Feast of Trumpets becomes more and more apparent as the feast uh, being talked about. You've got an alarm, you've got trumpets, you've got shouting. All of these are Feast of Trumpets keywords. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 14, 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Look at Psalms 47, 5. God is gone up with a shout, the Hebrew word teruah there. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet, which we know is a shofar. This is exactly what First Thessalonians 4, 16 is quoting. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself uh, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's speaking of Yom Teruah. This is the day of blowing of trumpets. This is, he's referring to the rapture event here. Other idioms joined to the blowing of trumpets is also referred to as the last trump and the awakening blast. As we've discussed before, the last trump is the hundredth blow of the trumpet on the Feast of Trumpets. And we see a picture of the Messiah in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, completing this blow directly from the heavens above when he comes for his bride during the rapture. Now we'll see why it's called the awakening blast. The Jewish people believe that on a future Rosh Hashanah, the last trump will awaken the dead. The resurrection day we are looking for that coincides with the rapture is what they believe will happen at a future last trump, the awakening blast. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So again, we can see this event uh, taking place during the Feast of Trumpets, where it says, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. Uh, God's going to bring, Jesus is going to bring uh, the spirits of those that died in Christ with him, and he's going to literally call up, he's literally going to blow uh, the, the dead bodies out of their graves and reunite them with their spirits and we're going to Bible says he shall by no means be before those that's going to be resurrected first they get resurrected and then we join them in there to meet our Savior in the skies what a glorious promise what a glorious hope Rosh Hashanah is also known as Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period now the feast of trumpets during Rosh Hashanah is also the event that precedes Jacob's trouble uh, Jacob meaning Israel so how do we know the tribulation or Jacob's trouble starts on this day? Well, let's take a look at several scriptures to determine this. First of all, Jeremiah 30 verse 6 says, Ask uh, ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Uh, that day referring to the great tribulation. Isaiah 26, 17 says, Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery uh, is in pain and crieth out in a pang so have we been in thy sight O Lord Isaiah 13 6 to 8 says how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they shall be afraid pangs and sorrows uh, shall take hold of them they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth they shall be amazed one at another their faces shall be as flames Daniel 12, 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, uh, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Zephaniah 1, 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near, and it's referring here to the great tribulation, it is near and hasten greatly, even the voice of the Lord, uh, or sorry, even the voice uh, of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers. So the great day of the Lord year and a day of trouble and distress, this is referring to the tribulation period. And we can see here where it says uh, a day of the trumpet or Yom Teruah or a day of blowing. This is referring here to the Feast of Trumpets. So we have the Feast of Trumpets happening and then we have the Day of Trouble uh, directly following that. And which we know is the, the, uh, the tribulation period that uh, follows immediately after the rapture takes place. You've got all that in this one verse taking place. As you've seen from these verses, specifically Zephaniah 1.14, it clearly ties the beginning of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period with the blowing of a trumpet, which we know he's talking about the Feast of Trumpets. Then you have the 10 days of awe or Teshuvah from Elul the first. Uh, for 30 days the Jews prepare their hearts for the future judgment. Rosh Hashanah begins the 10 days of Av or the Teshuvah. On our calendar that would mean uh, from the beginning of August through till the middle of September around that time. Uh, starting at Tishri 1 you count 10 days uh, till the Feast of Atonement. 
these are the days of Teshuvah, days 1 and 2 for Rosh Hashanah, which uh, is the rapture period, followed by seven days, symbolic of seven years tribulation, with the eighth day uh, being the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. He then comes back on the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, to set up his kingdom and tabernacle with men for a thousand years. And we'll cover this some more in an upcoming video segment. Next on Rosh Hashanah, you also have the opening of the gates, the opening of the books, as well as the Day of Judgment, all happening on this day. So during the Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah, you have the gates of heaven being opened, you have the opening of the books, and you have a time of judgment. Yes, God is going to judge all of His children and hold you accountable for the talents that He gave you. But this judgment will not be in reference to sin or to determine your eternal destination. If you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life, He already paid the price for your sins on the cross of Calvary. The only thing you have to do to put His grace into effect is to accept what He's done for you on the cross by confessing your sins and asking Him to come into your life. Uh, we're going to cover the judgment period in just a few moments, but look at these verses that talks about the opening of the doors or gates. Psalms 24, 7 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. There's that key word, battle again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Uh, who is the King of glory? The, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So the King of glory with his bride is coming in when the doors are opened on the Feast of Trumpets. So who is the King? We know it's the Lord mighty in battle. And you can see here this verse referring to the everlasting doors, uh, which is uh, during the time of uh, Rosh Hashanah, these doors are open. And again, we can see here that the battle cry it's talking about here is also a key word we know is referred to uh, in the Feast of Trumpets. Then Psalms 118 verse 19 says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. So here we see the righteous, the raptured saints, enter into the gates which is opened during the Feast of Trumpets. Isaiah 26 2 says, Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. So during the Feast of Trumpets, the gates of heaven is open so that the king and his bride, the raptured saints, uh, can enter through it. Then you have the opening of books and the time of judgment. So what happens after we enter through the gates? Well, the Bible says we're going to be judged according to how we've worked with the talents that God gave us. It's extremely important that we win souls for Christ. Uh, anything you do for the Lord, no matter how small it may seem, will determine your level of reward uh, in the end. In Jewish history, it is also believed that every year on Rosh Hashanah, the heavenly court is in session. The books are open and God literally looks over every person's account to see how we took care of his investment in us. In other words, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and have accepted his gift of salvation, find something to do. Uh, give out tracts at busy shopping centers, uh, witness to friends, neighbors, and even complete strangers, or print flyers uh, with a salvation message on and place them on shoppers' cars in parking lots. Uh, do something, do anything to impact the kingdom of God. Now look at these verses of scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, All of us must appear in front of Christ's judgment seat. Then all people will receive what they deserve for the good or evil they have done while living in their bodies. 1 Corinthians 3.14 If any man's work abide which he hath built up thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Daniel 7.10 says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So we have open gates, open books, and judgment being passed on this day, uh, the Feast of Trumpets. But here's a verse of scripture we as believers in Jesus Christ uh, should really get excited about. Hebrews 9.28 says, Likewise, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of humanity, and after that he will appear a second time. This time he will not deal with sin, but he will save those who eagerly wait for him. And this is referring to the time uh, when he appears at the rapture. So when Jesus comes back, he comes to save the saints. Uh, and we, when we are judged, we are judged without reference to sin because Jesus already paid the price. What, what is he saving us from? He's saving us from the, the wrath that God is going to pour out over the earth during the time of the tribulation. So if we are judged, what are we judged of? We judged according to how we work with our talents. And based on that, a reward is given. 
We will not be judged with sinners or with reference to sin because the blood of Jesus Christ literally covers all of our sins when we stand before the judgment seat of God. That's why it's so extremely important that you accept Jesus Christ in your life, else you'll be without covering, else you'll stand before God having to give an account for every single word that uttered over your mouth, every single deed you've done, uh, whether it be good or evil. The Bible says God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil in Revelation. Rosh is also known as the coronation of the king. Uh, the Feast of Trumpets is known as the day when the king is crowned. Uh, it's also known as Hamalech, which is the Hebrew for the day of the coronation of the king. The Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah is known to the Jewish people as the day to remember the great king over all the earth. They read Psalms 45 and Psalms 47 seven times on Rosh Hashanah. They believe it's on this day that the Lord will be crowned King of Kings because it was a regular practice to enthrone the kings of Israel and Judah on the first of Tishri, which is Rosh Hashanah. And there are four parts to the enthronement of a Jewish king. The first is the giving of the decree. Uh, then the ceremony of taking the throne, then you have the acclamation, God save the king, and you have the subjects pledging their allegiance. First of all, the giving of the decree, we see that in Psalms 2, verse 6 to 7, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Uh, we know Zion is referring to Jerusalem, and we know Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, so it's referring to Israel here. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Then a rod or scepter is given in Genesis 49.10. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until he, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And we know that word gathering again is alluding to the rapture. Hebrews 1.8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So he come as a prophet, he was resurrected as a priest, and he comes back as king of kings. Then you have the ceremony of taking the throne, which involves being anointed. 2 Samuel 5.3 says, So all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. 1 Kings 1.34 And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel, and blow ye with the trumpet. Here we see the Feast of Trumpet themes again. An enthronement ceremony is in progress, and trumpets are being blown. Revelation 4 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in the heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew these things which must be year after. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So we have open doors here going on. In, uh, we can see that this is referring to the Feast of Trumpets. A trumpet is blown. Uh, we know this is Yom Teruah, also speaking of the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, come up hither is referring to the rapture of the saints. Uh, we know that this is also happening during the Feast of Trumpets. And a throne was set. So we can see the enthronement ceremony taking place directly after the rapture event uh, that uh, preceded it. Then you have the acclamation, uh, God save the king, taking place. First Kings 139 says, And Zadok the priest took an horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save King Solomon. Second Kings 11.12 And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. So this is all part of an enthronement ceremony. Israel was taught uh, these ceremonies by God as dress rehearsal or holy convocations. Uh, this enthronement ceremony is exactly what's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets after the rapture. Then you have uh, the fourth thing happening is the subjects pledging their allegiance. Psalms 50 verse 4 says, He shall call uh, to the heavens from above and to the earth, uh, that he may judge his people. Verse 5 says, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Verse 6 says, And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. I mentioned earlier that Psalms 47 is sung seven times by the Jews during the Feast of Trumpets on Rosh Hashanah. This is because Psalms 47 is known as the coronation psalm and this is probably what's going to be sung during the coronation of the king.
Here yes, Psalms 47 verse 1 it says, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises, O God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king. Sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abram, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. So you can see uh, it's about kingship, the enthronement, the sound of a trumpet. You have God sitting upon the throne, which is referring here to the enthronement ceremony. Uh, you've got the, uh, he is greatly exalted. You've got the acclamation. Uh, you've got the subjects pledging their allegiance. All this is referring uh, to events taking place during the Feast of Trump. So all throughout Psalms 47, we see the Feast of Trumpets, the coronation of the king, the acclamations being made, and the allegiance being pledged. Psalms 102 verse 13 says, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her, yea, the set time. We know that word is Moed or the feast day or appointed time is come. Psalms 102 verse 6 to 18 says, When the Lord shall build up Zion, and we know Zion is referring to Jerusalem, which we know is the capital of Israel, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. That's the Hebrew word akaron, which means generally late or last or latter. In other words, he's talking to us. When you see Zion being build up when you see uh, uh, Israel becoming a nation when you see the recapture of Jerusalem in 1967 it says when you see that happening the generation that sees that happening that's the generation that will see the Messiah coming back and that is us and finally Rosh Hashanah is also known as the wedding of the Messiah or Hakidusin. Look how this day is characterized in Joel. Joel 2 verse 15 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of a closet. So we see the wedding taking place around the same time as the blowing of the shofar and the word closet here is uh, referred to hupa, which is the Hebrew word hupa, which is the place or the marital chamber as it's also referred to. In Judaism, they get married under the hupa, and as in most cultures, uh, the lady takes on her husband's name. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 23, 6. In his day, Judas shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our right Righteousness. Then look at Jeremiah 33 verse 16. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall be dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So we can see here that she is taking on his name. The bride is taking on the bridegroom's name. Here we have a picture of Abram's servant Eliezer finding a bride for Isaac. And we know in those days the, 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 you know, the parents normally arranged the marriages. Uh, you can reference that in Genesis 24. In a traditional ancient Jewish marriage ceremony, the groom went to the home of his potential bride. He carried with him three things. First of all, a large sum of money, a betrothal contract, and a skin of wine. If the father was impressed and accepted the bridegroom's offering, he then called the daughter for her response. Then if things were acceptable to her, the bride-to-be drank the wine and immediately a trumpet sounded to announce the betrothal. Uh, during the following year of betrothal, the couple could not see each other alone. A chaperone was uh, always to accompany them wherever they went. Uh, during this year, the bridegroom went to his father's house to prepare a place or a hoopah or a honeymoon bed. No engraved invitations were sent out for the wedding. If people preparing the calendar wanted to reserve a day for the celebration, they had a problem. When the bridegroom was asked for the date of his wedding, he could only reply, no man knows except my father. Why? Because he could not go and get his bride until his father approved of his son's preparations. The bride therefore had to always be ready. Often she kept a light burning in the window and an extra jar of oil on hand lest the bridegroom come in the night and find her unprepared. 
when the groom's father decided that everything was in place and released uh, his son to go fetch his bride, a second trumpet was blown. This trumpet to announce the groom's coming was called the last trump in ancient Jewish customs. Thus announced, the bridegroom took the marriage contract to present to the father of his intended bride. He claimed her as his bride and took her from her father's house to his father's house where his father would be waiting to receive the couple. This ceremony was part of the Jewish roots of ancient times. One must pause uh, and digest the awesome correlation between this marriage ceremony and the Bride of Christ. This ceremony is a foreshadowing of things to come. And here's how it parallels with the wedding of the Messiah. Jesus is the bridegroom and his best offering by which he bought us was his sacrificial death at Calvary, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Uh, the contract was salvation, John 3.16. The wine the bride drank was symbolic of regeneration, John 3.3, 3, or being born again. During the time of betrothal, uh, we, his bride-to-be, the couple, was chaperoned. We know the Holy Spirit is our chaperone because Jesus promised not to leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit to act in his stead, John 14, verse 16 through to 17. The bridegroom went to his father's house to make ready his wife's new home. Jesus also said that he would go to prepare a place for us in John 14, verse 1 through to 3. When the bridegroom was asked when the big day would be, he responded that no man knew the answer except his father in heaven. Matthew 24 verse 36. The bride had to be in a state of constant readiness and know the sound of the feast. So she would not be caught unaware. And we can see that in Mark 13, uh, 32 to 37. When the father decided that all was in order, he released his son to go and bring his bride home. And so will it be when he comes for his bride, the church. Then the last trump was sounded to announce his coming for his bride. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We as Christians await with bated breath and expected heart and an ear attuned to the sound of the trump. Then the wedding of the Messiah will be consummated. 2 Corinthians 11 to and Ephesians 5 verse 27. What a glorious day it will be when we sit around the table of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember Jesus was a Jew and he was acquainted with their customs. He taught in parables to protect the hidden mysteries of the word from Satan. So in summary, in this video segment, we made some very significant discoveries surrounding the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> and in case you're still wondering uh, what the hidden secret of Rosh Hashanah is, is the discovery that the rapture will take place on the Feast of Trumpets some year. We don't know what year, but we know it will take place on one of the two days during this feast. We've seen scripture after scripture illuminating this truth. And now that you know what feast he'll be coming back on, watch and be ready. 